What keeps me hopeful in God when I can't see him? This is a man with a problem. How do I hold on to my faith when life is tough? Come on now, tell me. Why do we as Christians sometimes fall short of our beliefs? What does being a Christian truly mean? What does it imply to be a living example of the gospel? But what is the nature of this matter? Now, we know that billboards are advertisements designed to point us to something or someone, ideally located in a very highly trafficked and visible area. I can't help but notice every time we make our way back home to Kansas from a visit in Illinois, going through Topeka and on the left hand side of the road is KU basketball advertisement with all their championship trophies and directly across the same highway is a, a K-State football uh, billboard for everyone to see. So I decided that I would conduct some independent research on billboards and so I googled funny billboards. Now I'm going to warn you all from the beginning proceed with caution. The majority of those are not appropriate for Sunday morning service, but I found a few that I found humorous. There was one that said, uh, have you offended a soccer mom lately? Question mark. It was an advertisement for an injury lawyer. <laughs> there was a steakhouse ad that read, there's plenty of room for all of God's creatures right next to the mashed potatoes. Another read, this year, thousands of men will die from stubbornness. In spray-painted red letters right below, it said, no, we won't. <laughs> Finally, one said, well, you did ask for a sign. Signed, God. You see, the sign is not the point. The sign is designed to point you to something or someone. And this is what Paul is saying to the church at, at Thessalonica. Like, we are to be living billboards for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just to the early church, but also to you and I today. Why? Because you and I, through Christ, we have this faith worth demonstrating. That we are called to be Christians worth emulating, and in turn, a church worth celebrating. What if our lives were living billboards for Jesus Christ? Let me be more direct. When people look at you, is it a reflection of Jesus that they see? Are we living confirmations of the gospel? Or are we contradictions? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this time that you have given to us. God, your word is so powerful, and we give you thanks for that today. God, I pray that it would be boldly proclaimed, and God, that it would be uh, filled with uh, power through your Spirit. God, I ask that every word that comes from my lips be of you, from you, and for your glory alone. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, briefly to 1 Thessalonians, beginning at chapter 1. Uh, while you're turning there, I sort of want to give you some context with a book that maybe to some is a bit unfamiliar. Thessalonica was the proud capital city of the, the Roman province of Macedonia. Uh, it was at the center of a very popular trading route. We know that Paul and Timothy and Silas had all preached there, and by our best indications in the book of Acts, it indicates for somewhere around three weeks. Uh, there was... Um, it was an incredible movement that was taking place. Uh, there was just one small problem that Paul and the other missionaries uh, were advocating for a different king than Caesar. They were advocating for King Jesus. And as you can imagine, as the gospel was being preached, uh, people were being saved. But we also know that any time we are preaching the gospel, there will be opposition. A mob of opposition incited riots and fearful the ministry would suffer because of it. Paul flees for a place called Berea, some 100 miles away. Still concerned, a few months later, Paul sends Timothy back to Thessalonica. And this is where we pick up our text today. If you're willing and able, would you stand with us as we read God's word? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're going to read the first four verses together. This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. 
We are writing to the church in Thessalonica. To you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, may God give you grace and peace. We always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly. As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we pray once more in Jesus' name that you would speak to us in a mighty and undeniable way. God, we ask that it would all be for your honor and your glory. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated. You see, the thing about a billboard is we want to assume that the advertisement is true. I remember a local restaurant in the area that shall remain nameless for the sake of church today, who was advertising the best steak in the land. So I decided one day that after church, my family and I would take them up on their offer. After all, it was my birthday month. It's a whole thing in our house, right? And so I thought, you know what? I'll eat steak if I want to. And so so we get into the restaurant and Monica and I do this little game and maybe you do it too when you're with your spouse or maybe other friends. I don't know. We're like, you're looking at the menu and the question is like, what you going to get, babe? I don't know what you're going to get, babe. You know, and the question just goes back and forth because what you're really wanting to see is how much they're willing to spend so that you know it's okay. And like, once I know I'm okay, it's steak every single time. And so after all, so so I ordered this eight ounce filet, medium, please, with the sweet potato, house salad, Italian dressing on the side. It was going to be a great birthday month lunch. There was just one problem. After we had waited uh, for a a significant amount of time, uh, our meals come out and on the plate in front of me was not what I ordered. I ordered an eight ounce filet medium, first world problems. What I got in front of me looked like a quarter pounder without a bun from McDonald's, flatter than a pancake right in front of me. And in this moment, I decided, despite the fact I had been savoring this steak in my mind already, that I was not going to be that guy until I was that guy. I politely asked our server, ma'am, I don't want to be that guy, but this isn't what I ordered. To which she replied, well, what did you order? To which I replied in my mind, shouldn't you know you're our waitress? But I didn't. I said, eight ounce filet, medium with that good garlic butter on top. She says, well, that's what you have, sir. Au contraire, I said, this? To which she replied, yes, this is an eight ounce filet. And at this point, y'all, I thought I was being like pranked on YouTube or something. And so I politely ask, is this a joke? This created an awkward and uncomfortable pause because I was not budging on the steak, to which my daughter chimed in in a very timely manner and said, don't forget what you preached on today, daddy, patience and grace. (laughs) It was over. I just ate whatever it was in front of me. It's a danger of false advertising. And why do I bring this up? Because I think if we're not careful, and I want to preface this by saying, I am so thankful for this church. I am so thankful for your love for the Lord and your love for people. I'm not pretending that we're perfect. I am thankful for the models and examples of Christ that countless amounts of you are, and I want to thank you for that. But I am concerned that in churches today, what we are selling people on is not what we're serving when it comes to church. We're trying to sell people on Jesus. We, we like the idea of selling people on Jesus, but what they see in us is not the real thing. We advertise, come see this Jesus, but yet they never see him in us. We advertise Christ as our Savior, but we're living like he's nothing more than a nice idea. It is a malignant misrepresentation of who Christ has called us to be. And what I am submitting to you, that in these chaotic times that we're living in right now, The lost world is watching because the world is searching. And as Heather Thompson Day says, when people ask, where is your God? It is not an indictment on God. The absence of truth is not God's fault. And as Christians, man, it's easy for us to fall into this trap, isn't it? Where we're like, ah, they don't want to hear what what, what we have to say. 
They're just going to blow it out of proportion. They're not going to like me. They're just going to be closed off to it. And I'm telling you, research indicates we are deceiving ourselves that openness to Jesus in our world is not the problem. Hypocrisy in the church is. Barna conducted a, a recent uh, survey that indicated 71% of Americans view Jesus as a whole in a positive light. Meanwhile, 63% of teenagers and adults combined claim to have made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ, which they still value today. You want to know what the leading cause of why people doubt Christianity is in 2023? Hypocrisy of religious people. And listen, I didn't come here to beat you up today. I'm just saying, yes, yes, we are all hypocrites. And no, perfection isn't the expectation. Christ took care of that on the cross. I'm just saying we've got to start being the people that God has called us to be. There has to be a sense of urgency. Like, listen to me, I, I'm not in any way suggesting that we celebrate what God condemns or that we go soft on the gospel. But we've got to start treating people like image bearers of God, not projects, problems, or obstacles. We've got to stop with our obsession of policing every other person on social media. Stop condemning others for being broken differently than we are. Stop sowing seeds of discord because of unchecked bitterness and hatred we're harboring in our own hearts. What if people knew us for who we're for instead of everything we're against? Saying as a church, we must be clear on who Jesus is. We must see ourselves the church, the people of God as living billboards that point people directly to Jesus in everything that we do. Mark Howell said, the greatest danger for any organization is to lose sight of its reason for existence. Here's what it means at street level. It's not about how many people show up on a Sunday or how great the Sunday morning production can be, how, how good the music is, or online presence, or if the preacher stays on topic. And it's not about events or how complicated the communion cups can be. Just flip that little tab down, it's a lot easier. How good the coffee is in the lobby. It's not about me or any other person who gets up on this stage today. A gospel-centered church makes the major thing the main thing in everything. It is and always will be Jesus. And this is exactly why Paul is commending the church at Thessalonica. In a different translation than what I read from this morning. It says, Paul, uh, Silvanus, which is Silas and Timothy, to the church. In the Greek, the word is ecclesia, a called out group of people of the, Thessalon of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. And I love that Paul uses this word in. He's not saying above or below or to the side, not outside of it, but in the midst of it, in it, surrounded by God. Paul knew this to be true. And because he knew this to be true, the future of the church in Thessalonica, though they would face many challenges, was never in danger because its mission was not influenced by external circumstances. You see, friends, churches are not buildings. They are people. I, I want to say that again. Churches are not buildings. The church is people. Christians. You see, churches worth celebrating are filled, were filled with Christians worth emulating. Dr. Jordan Rogers put it this way, a church worth imitating is a church worth celebrating. But before we know what, what a Christian does, we really need to know what a Christian is, right? And John MacArthur, when describing the, the, the church at Thessalonica, he said this, being a Christian was much more than a religious designation. It defined everything about them, including how they viewed themselves and the world around them. The label underscored their love for a crucified Messiah along with their willingness to follow him no matter the cost. It told of the wholesale transformation God had produced in their hearts and witnessed to the fact that they had been made completely new in him. 
They had died to their old way of life, having been born again into the family of God. You say, well, that sounds good. I'm interested in that. But what does that mean? It means that the gospel must affect every area of your life. All of it. Your decision-making, your relationships, your finances, how you treat your family when you come home exhausted from work tomorrow, how you represent Jesus to a lost, hurting, and broken world around you, to those who don't know Jesus, your neighbor, your classmate, your annoying coworker, your in-laws, your family, servers who want to argue with you about the cut of steak they never served you. Mark Howell said, because God transforms those whom he saves, we should expect that genuine conversion will produce visible results. Paul says, we always thank God for all of you and we pray for you constantly as we pray to our God and Father about you. We think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when it came to the church at Thessalonica, and I pray that it's true of us, that if someone were to accuse these believers of being genuine followers of Jesus, that the evidence to convict them would be apparent, guilty as charged. Why? Because their faith was genuine, active, and contagious. Friend, what about us? Paul points to the importance when it comes to the gospel of working faithfully. Of working faithfully. It's so hard to work and serve faithfully as a follower of Christ. Because we live in a world filled with opposition. And don't you think for a second that when you give your life to Christ, you don't now have a target on your back for the enemy. The Bible says the evil spirits and principalities in the unseen world. Satan is going to attack you. I mean, we just, we can walk out of this place today and, and we can quickly discover that there are a lot of people in this world angry with a God they claim not to believe in. Our responsibility isn't to change them, but to tell them of the good news of the gospel. God is still responsible for the outcome. God is responsible for the success of the gospel. He, Paul says, we think of your faithful work. We know James says that faith apart from works is dead. Our, our best efforts don't earn us salvation. Rather, our good works are an overflow of our salvation. James says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Down in verse 17, he says, so you see, faith by itself is not enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Paul goes on to say, with this confidence, he says, we know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. Now, in, I can already sense it. Some of you, your blood's starting to boil a little bit whenever we hear this word chosen because there are people in the world who are Armenian. There are people who are Calvinists. There are hyper-Calvinists. There's everyone obsessed about this predestination. And I just want to be perfectly clear with you today. This word for chosen comes from the Greek word ekloge, which means choice or selection or to be elected. God, all throughout Scripture, he chose people. Moses, Abraham, Paul, Lydia, countless amounts of others. And I know what that leads to. Some of us ask, well, well what about me? Like, am I on the list? And if I'm not, why even try? And what I'm telling you is the Bible is clear. We are not God's little robots. We're not the frozen chosen, not little puppets on strings. We're not some sort of divine artificial intelligence. This is adoption language that Paul is using. He's saying, listen, as God's people, you've been chosen. When the world rejected you, God chose you. When you felt left out and forgotten about, God remembered you. When you were cast out of that friend group, God picked you. When you were at your worst, God rescued you. You have not been excluded. You are, you are without excuse. 
This gospel invitation remains. The gift of salvation is available to you today, friend. And in case there's any misunderstanding about what this word chosen means and who it includes, John 3, 16, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Romans 1, 16, for I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. You see, good people don't go to heaven. Saved people do. Romans 3, 22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. This is really good news, church. It means that through the love of Christ, Almighty God, like you've been chosen. The question is, what are you willing to do with this invitation? Are you willing to receive it? That's your decision. And I want to be abundantly clear. I know I say this a lot, but it's this huge problem we fight in our world today. I know that someone you loved has told you over and over how awesome you are. And their intentions are good and they love you. But I'm telling you that God didn't choose you or me because of all the awesome things that we do or anything that we will ever do. Well, like, I love you. But when you get to heaven, I don't think God's going to be like, there he is, attaboy, man, you crushed it in life. Bro, you squatted 600 pounds, man. Praise be to me. You are a beast. I don't think God's going to look at her and be like, girl, you killed it on social media. I'm just saying, like, it's not about what we've done. It's about who he is. God is not, a, God is not as interested in, in what you do for a living as he is in how you live in the midst of the work he is doing. You don't work to get in. Or we don't work to stay in. We do these good works because we are in. Because by the grace of God, Jesus chooses you. And so we labor in love. Paul says we labor, we labor in love. It wasn't all that long ago. This is not my proudest parenting moment, so please do not report me to anyone. There's plausible deniability. I mean, I know the service is recorded, but we'll cut it off if we have to. It was not my best parenting move ever. I was at home, Monica was out busy, and, and she entrusted me to be taking care of our children. Not all of them were there, just a couple, but one of the honoriest ones was there, and I remember hearing this scream and this cry for help. So I go to the laundry room and I quickly realized our youngest daughter, Kelly, has plastic roller skates and she's trying to go down the staircase and she cannot figure why it will not work. And so in a moment of panic, I tried to calmly go over and convince her that this is not a good idea. And she continued to argue and continued to fall and eventually she got hurt. And what I shouldn't have said was, I told you so, but I did. And I'll never forget, as Kelly got up, she became so angry. But for whatever reason, she was angry with her sister who tattled on her the most. And so I'll never forget what she said. She crossed her arms, and as she stomped out with those plastic roller skates and falling all over the place, she said, I love Chloe, I love Yachty, that's our dog, and I love Daddy, and that's it. And her other sister just had this confused look on her face. You see, she knew what she wanted, just not what she needed. And here's why I bring this up, because in her frustration with others, she recklessly declared who she was and was not willing to love. And we can laugh about a silly little illustration, but we've got to be real about it in our own lives as followers of Jesus Christ. How many times does someone irritate us or get on our nerves? And we decide, you know what? I'm done with them. Forget them. They made me mad. They put me on blast. They're weird. They're not nice. Oh, don't worry, pastor. I'll be praying for them. Bless their hearts. There have been so many times in my life where my prayer to God has just been like, seriously, God. Like, some people are just impossible to deal with. To which God often responds, that's true and you're one of them. But Paul says, your loving deeds. And in the Greek, the word is kopos, 
which means laboring to the point of weariness, exhaustion, sweat, fatigue, and being a living billboard for Jesus, being the people that he's called us to be, it will be exhausting. There are no shortcuts. It takes patience. It takes grace. We know that certain people require extra grace, if you know what I'm saying. We all know people like that, and if you don't, well, it might be because you are one. But anyway, the tendency that we have is to look down on others, and when we do, we're taking our eyes off of Christ. And Paul is saying, don't forget who you're living for. God never called us to look down on them, but rather to point them to him. The Bible is clear. Jesus, Jesus indicates that saved people are sent people. Jesus says in John 20, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And I'm telling you this, church, when we refuse to tell them, we are rejecting him. Do you love them enough to let them know? It's a quote many of us have heard before, Penn Jillette of the, the, the famous magic duo Penn and Teller, who claims to be a major atheist, whatever that is. He says, how much do you have to hate someone to not share the gospel? This is coming from an atheist. You see, God never commanded us to make them believe. It's not our job to save them. It is our responsibility to tell them, direct them, and point them to Jesus, to be living billboards for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That this, this God of all creation would send his one and only son to die in our place, and in his great love and grace for you and for me, Jesus bled and died for the forgiveness of all of our sins. Grace replaced the wrath that you and I deserve. He was buried and on the third day he rose from the grave. He defeated death and is now seated at the right hand of God. And one day, as Thessalonians reminds us in every chapter, he is coming again soon. Now I understand that if you share that little bit with some random stranger it may not win you a lot of friends right away. Probably not going to get a lot more followers on social media or promotion at work. But I'm telling you, look at me, we are dealing with people's eternity. And it is not rocket science for you and I to look at this broken world around us and realize time after time, prophecy after prophecy is being fulfilled. We are closer right now to Jesus coming back than we ever have been before. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let no one go unwarned and unprayed for. Do your neighbors know? Do your coworkers know? What about your family? Your kids, your grandkids? Do they know? Are there people you know who are living unwarned and unprayed for? Are they ready? Are you ready? Paul says, For when we brought you the good news, it was not only the words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true, and you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. Paul is proclaiming, the, it was the proclamation of the word of God combined with the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, when the gospel of Jesus is heard and obeyed, lives are changed. When they saw Paul, they didn't just hear a bunch of preaching and teaching. When they saw Paul, they saw the gospel being lived out. Not just with his words, but in his life. I ask, friend, can the, can the same be said about you? And all the baggage of your past, listen, we've all got it. It's no excuse. Paul was a sinful man with a broken past. I mean, the dude killed Christians, and he got paid to do it. 
But he turned to God and he dedicated his entire life to pointing people to Jesus Christ, encouraging them to do the very same thing, to be living billboards for the gospel of Christ. We see that Paul presses on with confidence in the living God, the assurance of his salvation, and the promise of the eternal future with Christ. And he encouraged the church. He encourages you and me to do the very same thing, to encourage one another. Life is hard. The last thing we need is division within the church. It wasn't all that long ago, and all of you probably know, because I told pretty much everyone about it, whether you wanted to hear it or not, that I ran in a marathon. And I remember everyone sort of warning me that like at mile 20, like that's probably where you're going to hit a wall. You're going to be exhausted. Your body's going to feel like it's shutting down. It's going, to, it's going to be like a mind game to push on. And I remember I got to mile 20 and I thought, well, I, I feel fine. I feel good. So I pressed on and I was feeling very, very confident about myself until mile 25 of a, of a 26 mile race. And that's when it happened. That's when I started breathing funny. I started hurting in parts of my body that I didn't even know I had. I thought, there's no way that I can finish this even if I'm, even if I walk, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then I remember seeing a text message from a best friend that said, one mile left, buddy. You got this. Keep going. Great job. And I remember the feeling that came over me in that moment. Now, I still couldn't feel my legs, but I had an awesome feeling everywhere else in my body. I'm like, I can do this. Like, I, I didn't think I could, but I really think I can do this. And this is what Paul's plea to the church at Thessalonica. It's, it's his plea to the church. It's his plea to you and I. To keep going. To labor in love. To stand firm. To choose to view our current circumstances in light of God's eternal promises. You see, the more you understand something, the more confident you will be. It's important for us to understand that affliction is part of being a Christian. The enemy, the adversary, is going to try to keep you from being obedient in your pursuit of Christ. But Paul says this God we serve is so much bigger. The spirit that lives in us through Christ is so much stronger. That even when there's overwhelming conflict, even when it feels like all hell is breaking loose around us, we have this hope living in us. Leon Morris said, this hope is not a quiet, passive resignation, but an active constancy in the face of difficulties. So, so you received this message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought to you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. This is what Paul is saying that we do, church. That it's going to be hard. There's going to be opposition. Things aren't always going to go our way. There's going to be times where we don't think we can make it through the day. But we work and we wait. We labor in love. We engage in battle and experience blessing all at the same time. How? We cling to the hope of knowing that Jesus is coming back soon. Paul is saying that an authentic Christian community is an expectant community. If we are truly living and waiting for him, we will be a people about his kingdom business. We will have a contagious faith. As a result, you have been an example to all believers in Greece throughout both Macedonia and Achaia. And now the word of the Lord is ringing out. In the Greek, this is where we get our word for echo. He says, and now the word of the Lord is ringing out. It's echoing from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. This is so critical for us to understand, church. In a world of mistruth and confusion and chaos, we can live through Christ with this confident expectation. Our faith can be made contagious. You see, God's plan for his church is for the people on the inside to take the message to the outside. The Great Commission is not an invitation for outsiders to come and hear, but rather for the church to go and tell. You see, genuine commitment redirects our affections. It says we don't need to tell them about it, for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. They're breaking their past pursuits. They're mo they've moved away from their idolatry. 
And we know that idolatry is any time you take a good thing, make it a God thing, that makes it a bad thing. It's all those things that we would never want to admit, especially in church, but it's the things we really worship. Things like success, sex, influence, power, pleasure, health, and wellness. Paul says in verse 10, and they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. Paul's assurance to the church at Thessalonica and to you and I today is this, that there is one day coming, and it is coming soon. When Jesus comes back, there is coming a day when there will be no more deathbeds or ICUs or funeral homes, no more hospice or roadside crosses, no more miscarriages or rejection or discouragement. There will be no more divorce, no more broken friendships, no more addiction or depression, no more fear, no more tears. Jesus is coming to take it all away. And so we wait in this patient expectation, this grateful anticipation that Jesus is coming. And so the great call for you and I is to live like we believe that's true, to make our faith visible in all that we do. I read a story of, uh, it's part of the autobiography of Charles Spurgeon, known as one of the greatest preachers in all of history. A man who actually suffered from depression and anxiety for the vast majority of his life. But in his autobiography, as he writes of his conversion story, he talks about one Sunday morning at the age of 16, he's walking to church, to the church that he normally attended. But there was a very heavy snow that day and he found himself quickly in the midst of a blizzard. Doubting that he could make it to the church that he regularly attended, he decided to take a little side road and found a country chapel there. And he recalls as he went inside, there were somewhere between 12 and 15 people sitting in that little church that day. He said after there was several minutes of sort of awkward silence, it was clear that the pastor wasn't going to make it that day. And so he recalls a tall, wiry, elderly man, a local shoemaker, who very hesitantly stood up, approached the pulpit, and did his best to deliver a sermon that day. Spurgeon recalls this man was very inexperienced. He struggled to even pronounce the words right. But he says it did not matter. He delivered a simple but powerful message. He said, Jesus says, look unto me. Look unto me as I'm sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me, I'm dead and buried. Look unto me, I rise again. Look unto me, I ascend into heaven. Look unto me as I sit at the Father's right hand. Oh, poor sinner, look unto me, Look unto me, says the King of glory. Friend, when the world looks at you, is it a reflection of Jesus that they truly see? My prayer for us is that we would be a people who work faithfully, who labor in love, and stand firm with enduring hope. A church, a people known for being Christ-centered, grace-driven, mission-minded, committed to be real and willing to help heal, to motivate and encourage, to instill hope and courage, to rescue and restore, to confront and resolve, to guide and to protect, to give vision and to use wisdom, to build up and to grow together the visible representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a sin-fractured planet. Church, may we be living billboards for the gospel.